So, we continue our conversation here with a discussion of methods of intelligence, uh, well, methods of investigation, uh, our methods of investigation, that is. Um, we have folks who have revealed police collusion in state killings. We have folks who have figured out how to uh, both reveal and protect health data. We have a person who will give you basically a how-to to do some of this uh, intelligence gathering. And then we have some guy who leaked the Pentagon Papers. Um, I want to welcome Daniel Ellsberg uh, to our panel. I, th I think we let Daniel Ellsberg bite into lunchtime, right? All right, so let's start with um, Northern Ireland, the place that I started reporting in the early 80s and was actually happy, honored to meet one of our panelists. Paul O'Connor is now director of the Pat Finucane Center. Um, the center has offices in Derry, Armagh, and Dublin. It's named after a lawyer who was assassinated by loyalist paramilitaries in 89. <clears throat> he and his co-speaker, a presenter here today, Anne Caldwaller, Cad sorry, Anne Ad Cadwallader, well done. Close. Who is the author of this book? She'll, she'll forgive me if I promote her book. Um, Lethal Allies, which is for sale at a special conference price of just twelve pounds, right outside. Have spent years now researching um, police collusion in state killings in Northern Ireland, and they're going to talk to us about exactly how they compiled this dossier and how you can do something similar too. Not to mention the impacts that it will have. Uh, I'm going to introduce all of the panelists so that you can come up one after the other, I think is probably the best way to save time. Karen Spank writes about health politics and technology. Um, she was sued by Scientology for almost 10 years over publishing excerpts of their higher level courses. She won, you'll be happy to hear. She co-founded the Dutch digital rights organization Bits of Freedom, which she chaired for seven years and was the chair of the Dutch Big Brother Awards for 10 years. Feminism would require that we develop a Big Sister Award also, but maybe we'll do that on another day. Um, also with us is Nikki Hager. He's an author and investigative journalist, whom I'm sure most of you know. His books include Secret Power and Other People's Wars. He lives in New Zealand, and he's come all this way to tell us how to do what he does. Um, let's start with Anne, I think, right? Lethal Allies. Thank you. I'm going to be sitting right there, and I'll nudge you into time. Thanks. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. My name, is, as you heard, is Anne Cadwallader. I've worked in Northern Ireland for 34 years, mostly as a journalist, and then more recently as a caseworker with the Pat Finucane Centre. Now, the centre, as Laura also said, is named after the Belfast solicitor Pat Finucane, who was shot dead in front of his wife and children in 1989. After three investigations by the former Chief Constable of the Metropolitan Police, Sir John Stevens, the British government finally admitted he was shot dead by loyalists in collusion with both the police, the RUC, and with British military intelligence. London is still, we say, disgracefully, holding out on, a pro on its firm promise of a public inquiry into his murder. The Pat Finucane Centre works with bereaved families to try and find out who killed their loved ones. We believe London's failure to uphold the rule of law was the single most significant cause of the conflict in Northern Ireland. London has, however, always been very assiduous in covering its tracks in Ireland. The historian, Professor James Bowyer Bell, said nothing has been spared, resources, intimidation, loyalty, greed and patriotism in this endeavour. In the last resort, he says, London simply denies the evidence. <coughs> Collusion is a word that has been unfortunately debased over time by some for political purposes. There is no crime on the British statute book called collusion and no agreed definition of what it is. We in the PFC believe that if police officers or soldiers conspire to murder people or ignore what they know about murder, or if they cover up what they know, that's collusion. But collusion is difficult to prove, as the only witnesses to the original act are the guilty parties. The murderous acts carried out by colluders leave plenty of evidence, but the original conspiracy rarely does, unless someone breaks cover, and there are powerful reasons why this is so rare. Collusion, however, is absolutely vital to understanding the conflict in Ireland. Most of you in this room will believe it was based on religious differences, with London benevolently trying to keep the peace. 
that Catholics and Protestants were fighting each other, that loyalist and Republican paramilitaries were mirror images of each other. Well, given what we have uncovered, we see it somewhat differently, that London was a key player and used the kind of counterinsurgency tactics it had already honed in previous colonial wars in Malaya, Kenya, the Middle East, and elsewhere. The result of over 10 years' research into one series of time and geographically limited series of events is contained in the PFC's book published last year called Lethal Allies, British Collusion in Ireland. I'm glad to say it's become a bestseller in Ireland, and I have some copies here with me. The book names 25 loyalists, most of them murderers, who were also serving or former members of the Royal Ulster Constabulary or the British Army in Ireland. Sadly, we have been unable to name most of their masters in London who pulled their strings. Just as a quick introduction, this is a very short account of the various forces acting <coughs> on the state side during the conflict in Ireland. There was the UDR, the largest regiment in the British Army, whose members were locally recruited, armed and trained to kill. Then there was the UVF, the Ulster Volunteer Force, an illegal group of killers, some of whom were also members of the legal UDR. The UDA was the largest but least disciplined of the Loyalist forces. It wasn't banned until 1992, although it carried out hundreds of sectarian assassinations. Its victims, almost invariably Catholic non-combatants, shot dead while going about their ordinary day's business at work, at play, or at home in their beds. The RUC was the Royal Ulster Constabulary, 90% Protestant. And then, of course, there are all the other shadowy forces inflicted on the people of Northern Ireland, MI5, MI6, and so on, none accountable for their actions. Coming now to the key point, how did we carry out our research and make the shocking discoveries we did? We looked in all the usual places and some very unusual ones. The National Archives here in London, whenever we could afford to visit. We talked to bereaved families and eyewitnesses. We worked alongside any inquiry set up whenever that happened, not often. And then we worked with the historical inquiries team, a group of mainly former British police officers set up in Northern Ireland by a former chief constable of the police service in Northern Ireland, and more about that later. Finally, we also spoke to whistleblowers, but others here will go into that in more detail. So what did we find in the National Archives? The answer is a lot, but I'm limited on time, so here are just a few examples. Firstly, we found this document, which shows that even as they were setting up the UDR, the British government knew it would be used by loyalist paramilitaries to train and arm themselves against the nationalist population. I could give you dozens of examples of how that worked out in practice, but here's just one. The carnage caused on the single most devastating day of the conflict, the Dublin and Monaghan bombings in which 34 people, including an unborn child, perished in May 1974. These bombs were planned by a group of UDR men in conjunction with the UVF. We can name three with total confidence, but we strongly suspect others. This most significant extract from official papers shows that as early as 1976, barely four years into a 30-year conflict, the British Prime Minister of the day, Harold Wilson, and the then leader of the opposition, Margaret Thatcher, were being briefed that the largest regiment in the British Army, the UDR, was, quote, heavily infiltrated by extremist Protestants, i.e. loyalist paramilitaries, and that in a crisis could not be relied upon to be loyal. Indeed, the UDR became the main source of weapons for loyalist paramilitaries and the only source of modern weapons, such as Stirling submachine guns. Sterling submachine guns such as the one used to kill these 11 people, including the father of my colleague at the PFC, Alan Brecknell. It orphaned five children and left 19 fatherless. There was not even an investigation into its disappearance. Our second source was the families to whom we spoke, many of whom had never been asked before to say what they'd seen at the time of the attacks. They confirmed the paucity of the original police investigations and on several occasions were able to give us key corroborating information about perpetrators. Our third source was, believe it or not, old newspapers. When you have no access to confidential police information, you have to take what you can find. In the triangulation process, where you're trying to corroborate information from elsewhere, old court reports can help identify who was picked up and questioned, who was charged, who was acquitted or convicted, and that can be vital. Our fourth source was the Baron Inquiry in Dublin into the Dublin Monaghan bombings. As an official government inquiry in the South, it had limited access to RUC data in the North, and we gained massively important ballistic evidence linking the bombs in Dublin and Monaghan to a string of other murders north of the border. 
Mr Justice Barron concluded it was neither fanciful nor absurd to believe that members of the RUC and British Army were involved in mass murder and that it was also likely that individual members of both organisations either took part or planned mass murder. Mind you, London is still withholding massive amounts of intelligence and other documentation which it refused to provide to the Barron inquiry so there may be more to come if we ever get to see the papers. This is the kind of diagram that my colleague Alan Brecknell managed to draw up after the Barron Inquiry. It links perpetrators and weapons through the series of murders we were investigating and established they were indeed all carried out by permutations of the same gang. Then we come to the HET again. Its senior officers had supposedly unfettered access to RUC archives. The PFC took a decision to engage with the HET, although other human rights groups decided not to become involved. The HET was a deeply flawed truth recovery mechanism, but so far it has been the only one. One of the most incriminating cases the HET investigated was the bombing of the Step Inn in the village of Cady. They found evidence that RUC Special Branch knew of the bomb, had the gang under surveillance, but allowed the attack to go ahead, killing two people and injuring a further 30. Then there's the case of the four families whose loved ones were killed in a double bar gun and bomb attack in 75. They believed for three decades that the main man responsible was a cheese processor. The HET revealed that he was in fact a serving police officer. After five years' work combing through the archives, the HET, which remember consisted of former police officers, mainly from England, concluded these events should have sent alarm bells ringing all the way to the top of government. Yet nothing was done and the murderous cycle continued. Furthermore, the HET said in a separate report, this cannot be blamed on a few rotten apples, as the British government and unionists often claim. No, they said their investigations had the potential to validate claims of widespread and routine collusion. So we come to whistleblowers. This will be a whistle-stop tour of that, as others are dealing with this topic. We had evidence from three with varying standards of credibility. We had evidence from one, Colin Wallace, a former British Army press officer, about this man, Robin Jackson, possibly the most prolific killer during the entire conflict, who was also an RUC agent. If you look at our website, you'll find more about him. This slide shows you Colin Wallace's own handwriting dating back to 74. He's talking about Robin Jackson's involvement in the murder of a Catholic trade unionist and father of three, Pat Campbell, the previous year. Charges, wrote Wallace, against Jackson were dropped following RUC special branch intervention. Thank you for listening, and I'll take questions later. Okay. Good morning. Um, you, you'll see from that presentation that Anne spent many years as a very experienced journalist. I didn't, so my presentation might be a bit slower. My, my job this morning, I think, is, is to give you a taster of some of the other work that we're involved in. I think Anne has outlined very well the work that we've done around the issue of collusion between loyalist paramilitaries and the security forces. And I just want to give you a taster of some of the other documentation that we've found in the National Archives in Kew. And we have over 10,000, 12,000 declassified documents in our offices. So what we're doing today is really just giving you the briefest of, of a, a, a tour through that, of some of these documents and, and, and some of the issues that arise through that. Um, however, returning briefly to the issue of Pat Finucane, sometimes even private secretive reviews reveal, reveal damning new evidence. And we had a, this, the De Silva review into the murder of Pat Finucane. This review was ordered by David Cameron when he met Pat Finucane's family two years ago. That review, although extremely limited, revealed that between 87 and December 89, there was 270 separate incidents of security force leaks to loyalist paramilitaries. According to MI5 itself, 85% of the intelligence material in the hands of the largest loyalist group, the UDA, came from security force sources. And according to the same report, it was the police, the RUC, who suggested Pat Finucan as a murder target for loyalist paramilitaries. Um, this is a diagram from his report, from uh, his December 2012 report, where we see the source of some of these leaks. 8% from the army, 27% from the homegrown regiment of the British Army, the UDR, which was the largest regiment in the British Army, 4% from Special Branch, 19% from the police, and 41% unknown. So, so when we hear the Retired Police Office Association tell us that there is no actual evidence of collusion, these are the official reports, the official documents. 
So I want to just take you on a very brief tour through some of the other kind of documentation we find. And for instance, this is a record of a meeting um, between the British government, Sir Frank Cooper, and other senior officials in Belfast and loyalist paramilitary. So you'll see that at the meeting were the UVF, who six months prior to this meeting had bombed Dublin and, and Monaghan and killed 33 people, the Orange Volunteers, another loyalist paramilitary group, the UDA, and one other UVF man, not known. And at the meeting, they complained that the police were not recruiting enough people, that there was discrimination against loyalists, and that there was discrimination against former detainees. In other words, they were the loyalist paramilitary groups were meeting the government to urge them to recruit more loyalist ex-prisoners. How bizarre is that? Another document that we find at the time, and by the way, we've dozens of these documents to back this up, it's not one document, is that the Ministry of Defence at the time must have been the only Ministry of Defence in Western Europe or in NATO to have a series of documents called Arrest Policy for Protestants. Now, what this, in effect, was, was a policy on when not to arrest loyalists. They, they list a whole series of categories where loyalists are not to be arrested, um, which is, as you would agree, a, a fairly bizarre type of policy for the Ministry of Defence to have. Um, at the same time, we found these lists of statistics. This one, for example, is from 1976. Now, let me give you a short guide through this here. At the very top in blue, you see a particular period of who has been killed and wounded by, and they, they characterize it by Protestant extremists or by Catholic extremists. That's, that's their, their definition of it. Now, you'll notice that in that particular week, um, the IRA and other Republican groups hadn't killed or wounded anyone. And in the same week, loyalist paramilitaries had killed four and injured 16. Now go down to the screening statistics. Screening was a process whereby people would get arrested at random by the British Army, taken to an army post, and you would be screened. You would be asked, how many rooms in your house? Do you have a dog? How many are in your family? Who's working? What are your political views? And they would build up an intelligence picture of entire communities. It was later ruled to be illegal. Now, we look at the screening statistics, and it's broken down to 3rd Battalion, 8th Battalion and 39th Battalion. In other words, all six counties of Northern Ireland. And they've actually quite helpfully broken it down by religion. And we see that in that six month period, 1,946 people were screened. Now look at the very bottom table and you'll see that 3rd Battalion in that one week screened three Catholics and no Protestants. 8th uh, Battalion, 16 Catholics and no Protestants. 39th Battalion were very active, 29 Catholics and no Protestants. And we see their, their, their attitude towards a group that was actually heavily involved in violence during that precise period. Um, moving on now to a, very, a, a, a separate issue, and that is the issue of prosecution or non-prosecution of soldiers who were killing civilians. And we find, for instance, that General Sir Cecil Blacker is writing to Lieutenant uh, General Frank King. He says, the Attorney General has assured me that he himself carefully reviews every serious allegation against a soldier. He assured me in plainest terms that not only he himself, but also the director of public prosecutions and senior members of his staff, having been army officers themselves, having seen active service, were by no means unsympathetic in their approach to soldier prosecutions in Northern Ireland. We see here that They've agreed there will never be a conflict between the Attorney General and the General Officer commanding the British Army in Northern Ireland, and ministerial intervention will, will be unlikely. This was entirely illegal to give the Army this level of access on prosecutions. So we have ministers and civil servants in Whitehall making decisions, and we've bereaved and anguish and anguished families at home, and you'll, you'll see why we, we flagged this up. This is one case that, where we found the papers in the case, and it involved the killing of a, a man called J.P. Cunningham, who was seen, and you'll see in the army log down below, uh, believed to have a mental age of 10 years of age. He was a vulnerable adult. In the regimental log, they referred to him as the, the village idiot. You see here that he was, he was terrified of soldiers, he was confronted in a country road, he turned, he ran into a field, and he was shot and killed. The soldiers who killed him were never questioned by the police, and the family was offered £750. Move on to the, another case This involved a, a, a child that was killed, and the family of the child, a 12-year-old, were seeking a £1,000 compensation. 
And in this case, um, a civil servant here in Whitehall ruled that the accepted rate for a minor is £750. In this case, uh, involving a man called Christopher Quinn, it's quite, quite an interesting case because the legal advice in this case was that Christopher Quinn was entirely innocent, that he was unarmed, that he'd left behind five children, and therefore the case was valued at £10,000. But the counsel uh, for the Ministry of Defence said that the family was willing to accept 750 because they were going to be forced to go into court and the onus should be put on the plaintiff, as they said. In effect, they got £500. Um, so these are the, the type of documents that we, we find in the, in the archives. During the conflict, over 350 people were killed by the British Army, some 300 plus by the Army and, and 50 plus by the RUC, while on duty. As Anne has pointed out, there were many, many instances where people were killed by police officers or soldiers who weren't officially acting in that capacity, but were acting as loyalist paramilitaries. No member of the police was ever convicted of murder. Four soldiers were convicted, but all were released within five years of their life sentence, and all four were allowed to rejoin their regiments. Come now to the issue of rubber and, and plastic bullets. Um, three people were killed by plastic bullets or by rubber bullets in the early 1970s, and 14 were killed by the subsequent uh, plastic bullets that were introduced. Eight of the victims were under 16 years of age. We find documents from a medical committee whose job it was, whose legal responsibility it was, to advise government ministers on the safety of plastic bullets. They're based at Port and Down Chemical Weapons uh, Establishment. And it is their statutory duty to do this. And they are telling us in the correspondence that they, they are unable to provide such safety advice because the Ministry of Defence is not telling them what are the extent of deaths and injuries on the streets of, of, of Belfast and Derry. They've also, they, we also see in the correspondence that all plastic bullet guns that were in use in Northern Ireland were faulty, according to the Safety Committee of Port and Down. Um, you know, we're, we're not talking a small number here. In 1981-82, there was 30,000 fired that year during the hunger strike. So... Um, the plastic bullet guns are faulty, but they're not replaced for a further five years. Um, for instance, in 1982, Stephen McConaughey was killed. They claimed at the time, at the inquest, that that particular gun was faulty. In fact, they knew that all their guns was, were faulty. Now, I don't want to divert attention from the fact that a soldier shot them at, at point-blank range, and it's the soldiers responsible. That case is reopened, by the way. Um, one of the, the, the documents that we found in the archives was a letter from the Chief Constable of the RUC following a query from the Prime Minister here in London about the amount of people that were coming out of the dedicated interrogation centres with very serious injuries. And he wrote this memo, the Chief Constable of the Police, which is worthy of Monty Python, and it's about the self-inflicted injuries. You see, these, these clever IRA people, they, they inflict these injuries on themselves. Um, some of the injuries that he talks about are failing, feigning illness and attempting to fall off a chair during interview, interview, scratching your wrist with a pin, throwing oneself on a floor, thereby causing injury to the face. Can you imagine how difficult it is to throw yourself on the floor and not use your hands to stop the fall? I mean, those Irish are so devious. Um, throwing oneself down a flight of stairs, cutting a wrist with a plastic knife, injury to neck by self-strangulation. I don't know what the police are doing while this is happening. <laughs> Banging your head and wrists on a table, uh, causing a nosebleed, punching one's own face, poking one's own eyes, and so on. Self-burning with cigarettes, uh, burning your limbs on hot radiators, scratching with nails, and poking nails into ears. This is the chief of police, the chief constable. This is his answer back to the prime minister on the self-inflicted injuries, I ask you. Um, so moving swiftly along. Um, the very final issue we come to is that of the hooded men, which the hooded men concerns the case of a number of men who were subjected to in-depth interrogation following the introduction of, of internment. And this involved five particular methods of interrogation, including hooding, wall standing, white noise, and, and so on. The men, when they were finally released from uh, internment, 
uh, sought damages from the government and took legal action. And this is the legal advice that came back. Her Majesty's government sought the very best legal advice on the civil actions, which claimed wrongful arrest, trespass, conspiracy, and so on. The gravest allegation is that of conspiracy between the defendants, i.e. the Northern Irish Prime Minister Brian Faulkner and Lord Charrington, Minister of Defence, to subject the plaintiff to local acts. We are advised that the only practical case was to settle these actions out of court. Why? Because they knew that they would otherwise face very serious charges. The Irish government, as a result, took this case to the European Court of Human Rights. It was the first interstate case to go to the court, and it was the only case to run its full length through the European Court of Human Rights. In 1978, the European Court of Human Rights ruled that the treatment of the men was inhumane, degrading, but not torture, because there was no evidence of command responsibility. There was no evidence of ministerial involvement. There was no evidence that it was a policy. So in the archives, we began to find documents. We went to Irish State Television uh, earlier this year and finished this. The, the, this we, we went to Irish State Television. They looked for further documents and came across the following memo from the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland in the mid-1970s, Marilyn Rees, where he said, it is my view that the decision to use methods of torture, he's quite clear that it is torture, uh, was taken by ministers, in particular Lord Carrington, then Secretary of State for Defence. He's quite clear about that. So after the programme, um, we and others approached the Irish government, and last week they approached the European Court and asked for the case to be reopened. Now, the case is highly significant because this judgment in the European Court that this was not torture but was ill-treatment has been used by the Israeli Supreme Court to justify the treatment of Palestinians, and it was used extensively in the torture memo that was supplied to President Bush in the run-up to the Iraq war. And uh, there's every hope now that that judgment can be overturned. Thank you. Thank you.